Alright everybody, if you're in the stream here watching, uh, welcome to our first virtual online meeting for Math 105, Mathematical Thought and Practice, Bridgewater State University. Um, so if you're watching and you're a part of the course this semester, um, the best way to interact live uh, with this stream is inside of Twitch in the stream chat. Um, just type your questions, type your comments. I'm also going to be keeping an eye on Slack uh, in the doctor's office channel while we're here. So if you're having any issues interacting with the stream that's going on in Twitch, uh, feel free to jump into our Slack site, go into the doctor's office channel, um, and you can interact with us there as well. Um, I'm just going to take a quick second and get my Slack set up on my screen so I can be watching both of those things at the same time. Here it is. So again, uh, if you're using the Slack uh, website or the online app, just head over to the doctor's office channel uh, and post any questions, comments, um, anything that uh, add to the discussion or questions about what we're talking about. Uh, feel free to drop those in there or drop them into the into the uh, uh, the Twitch uh, chat stream as we're going along. So this first week's worth of content uh, that we've been working through so far. Um, gives us an introduction to the mathematical idea of sets. Uh, and sets are a super powerful uh, notion, super powerful idea. They're really the main way that mathematicians, and by extension anyone else, right, um, organize information about collections of objects. So just for starters, when we think about what sets are, they're just collections. They're a way to package together a group of things and then treat those things either individually, so every set is made up of a bunch of individual elements in it, um, but then the nice thing about sets is we can also treat a set as an object in and of itself. So, for example, um, let's say I think about the... Uh, uh, let's let T be, and I'm going to write this in words first, the set of all uh, let's see, football season just started, so we'll use a football analogy. The set of all NFL teams um, belonging to the AFC East division. So one way of describing a set is just to write out in words what membership in that set means. Um, and the only stipulation that we put down on top of this is a logical one, by which I mean we can always define a set using a sentence as long as we meet the logical criterion that we need to be able to decide based on the membership in this set um, whether or not something belongs to the set or does not belong to the set. Everything either belongs or does not belong. So there can't be any gray area. We need to be able to, to, uh, to tell for absolute sh uh, certainty, given an object, whether or not it does belong or doesn't belong. There's no gray areas in between. Um, this is because when m the kinds of logic that mathematicians practice uh, is called propositional logic. And in propositional logic, every statement that we can utter is either a true statement or it's a false statement. Um, and we can attach other sort of qualifiers and quantifiers to that, um, but there's no gray area in between true and false in mathematical logic. Um, there's something called fuzzy logic in which there is, but we're, we're not going to touch that uh, in our introductory course. And so taking a look at the set that we're talking about here, the set of all NFL teams that belong to the AFC East. Um, this, is, this defines a set, we can say, because if you give me the name of, a, of an NFL team, or really if you give me the name of anything at all, um, I can tell you for sure either that thing belongs to the set T or that thing does not belong to the set T. So there's no, there's no in-between. There's nothing that's kind of half in and half out. Well, this is kind of an AFC East team. Uh, a daffodil is kind of an NFL team in the AFC East. No, a daffodil is definitely not an AFC East football team. The New England Patriots definitely are uh, an AFC East NFL team. So this verbal description defines for me a set T. So don't be shy. I think one of the things that if you've had a lot of experience in, in math classes that are in the sort of traditional vein of mathematics, the kinds of math you learn in high school 
algebra, geometry, trigonometry, you're used to always having to express a mathematical idea using numbers, variables, formulas, equations, notation, all languages that even mathematicians don't speak in. Mathematicians speak to one another in English, in words. Um, and so don't be shy. I know many of you are kind of shy when you're starting out. Don't be shy expressing those thoughts in the written word. Um, because that's often the first step toward really understanding a mathematical problem is writing it down, writing down your idea, getting it into precise language. And from that precise language, we can often push to, to the more specific and more specialized ways uh, in which we can communicate. So this pink box that I've drawn here is drawn around what we would call a verbal description of this set. But there are some other ways that we can use to express uh, what a set looks like and, and what criteria of membership define that set. Um, the second way, and we're going to push toward one way here that's a little bit more explicit, um, and then some other ways that are using a little bit more mathematical notation. The second method I want to talk about briefly here uh, is called the roster method. And just like the name suggests, if you if you say a roster for like a sports team, like a roster for the New England Patriots, for example, when you think about what a roster looks like, it's a big long laundry list of every single player on that team, right? Um, the starters, the backups, the maybe the coaches, depending on what roster you're looking at. So to roster, to write down a roster for something, is to very explicitly list out everything. Right? So if I wanted to write a roster for this set the set of all NFL teams that belong to the AFC East division, then what I would be saying I'm doing is I would just write out Patriots. So there's one example of an element which belongs to this set T. Um, but there are other elements also, even if Patriots fans tend not to uh, acknowledge the existence of other teams in the AFC East. They are out there. Um, Jets, the Bills, the Dolphins, Um, and, oh gosh, help me out here. Ravens? Okay, now I'm going to have to look this up. Uh, so just bear with me for a second. I'm going to bring my browser over here. Check this. Just because I don't want to get this wrong. Because we are live. Uh, the Bills. The Dolphins, the Patriots, the Jets. Okay, so the Ravens are AFC something else. Are they the North, the South? All right, my fault. So there's only four teams. So if I just write this out, whoops. All right, let me close this down here. Um, just by writing out the, the, the elements in this set, I've now come up with what we can call a roster. Um, but there's one more bit of notation that we'll use to, to add to the description that we have here. Um, and that's that I'm going to also tack in a curly set of braces. Okay. So whenever we use a curly set of braces in our notation, this comes with the idea that what's inside, what's inside the curly braces is what defines the set. So if I hadn't written these curly braces here, then I'm not really writing down a description of a set. I'm just kind of listing some objects. It's the putting curly braces around them that I'm doing here that actually makes this into a description of a set at the end of the day. So a roster method uh, description of this set T, the set of all NFL teams belonging to the AFC East division, would look like this. Patriots, Jets, Bills, Dolphins. Now, I happen to have listed the Patriots first here not for any particular reason other than that I'm teaching this course in New England and I'm assuming that probably the majority of you who are watching who follow football um, probably are Patriots fans. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I grew up in the Midwest. I'm a Minnesotan, so I root for the Vikings. I still do. It's a very difficult team to root for, especially compared to the Patriots. Um, but I try to be reasonably nonpartisan uh, and, and support you know those of my family and friends around me that do support the Pats. Uh, so I listed them first in this list. Um, but since I, when I list a roster, I have to choose some way of ordering the elements that I list. 
Um, one of the agreements that we make in mathematics about sets is that the order in which we list the elements of a set actually doesn't matter to the definition of the set. So order isn't important. So I would have the same set if I listed this roster, Patriots first, and then Jets, and then Bills, and then Dolphins. It would be the same set if I took the Jets and the Bills and I traded places. Right? If I decided to put the Bills first, or at least put them before the Jets. Make my colleague in the philosophy department who's from Buffalo very happy. Um, but I haven't changed the set by changing the order in which I've listed the elements in their roster. Because after all, the set is still the set that I described in the same way in the pink box at the top here in my verbal description. This is still the set of all NFL teams that belong to the AFC East. It doesn't matter what order I write those elements in. So if you and your buddy both list a roster for a set, and that roster consists of the same elements, if they're in different orders, that doesn't matter. You've both described a perfectly good roster uh, for a set. So those are the first two, and these are also, I feel like these are probably the most rich, language-rich, understanding-rich ways to describe what's in a set. Right? If you give me a, a very carefully written verbal description, like this one here, that tells me exactly what this set is. If you give me a roster, if it's, po if it's even possible to write down a roster for a set, um, then that's a very, very explicit way of telling me what belongs to that set. But sometimes, either, a verbal description is not specific enough, it might not be concrete enough, um, it might be kind of unwieldy, depending on the, the context. And there are some sets where writing a roster is not practical either. Um, sometimes there's just too many elements in a set for us to want to list all of them out in a roster. Or maybe there's so many that it's not even possible to list all of them out. Or oftentimes in mathematics, um, mathematicians will, will understand a set without necessarily understanding what all of its elements are. And there's a whole field of mathematics called combinatorics uh, that relates to the question of how do we count how many objects are in a set uh, if we don't have a way of listing them all out in front of us. If I can't get a roster, how can I still figure out how to count how many elements are there? Um, and so when these descriptions are not practical or not specific enough, um, the most sort of satisfying way for a mathematician to use notation to write down a set is to use a notation that we call set builder notation. And this is probably the most confusing type of notation to somebody who isn't used to this means of expression in math. So how does set builder notation work? Well the first feature to draw your attention to is that it starts and it ends with the same curly brace that we used in the roster method. Remember, these curly braces are what tell me that I'm writing down the notation to describe a set. Um, it's what happens in the middle that's kind of weird, or at least different uh, from the ways that we were expressing before. So there's two parts to set builder notation that goes inside of those curly braces. And those two parts are separated by a separator. Very often the separator is a vertical bar, so in our textbook, we use a vertical bar. Um, some authors, depending on, on where you go, will instead of using a vertical bar, use a colon. But the point is that one of those two things is used to separate the first part of the set builder notation from the second part of the set builder notation. I'm going to use a vertical bar for the moment. And in set builder notation, two things happen. On the right side of this bar is a description. It can be a verbal description, but it doesn't always have to be a verbal description. It can also be expressed with an equation or with an inequality or some specific description um, of what set membership entails. In other words, how do we decide whether or not something belongs to the set or doesn't belong to the set? That description is what goes on the right side of the vertical bar here in the set builder notation. On the left side of the bar goes a description of what kinds of objects do we have? What kinds of elements? Where are my elements coming from? What's the larger universe, maybe, in which these elements live? So if I'm using set builder notation to express this NFL team set idea, 
um, then what I might do is first say that it's NFL teams that form my larger universe from which I'm getting the elements of my set. Um, so over here, I'm going to say something like, is an NFL team. Maybe I'll say it like that. Right. Um, and then on the right side of the bar, I have to describe which NFL teams belong to the set that I'm interested in, the set I'm calling T. Right. So according to my verbal description up here at the top, those are going to be the teams that belong to the AFC East division. So I'm going to write that in the right side of my bar. Belongs to the AFC East division. So often in set builder notation, the left side of this separator gives me a general statement about where my elements are coming from, and the right side gives me the more specific idea uh, of which elements from that larger context actually belong to the set that I'm interested in. And the only other thing that happens often in set builder notation, and it's not only to make it more confusing for um, if you're not comfortable with mathematical notation, um, but it's also, again, to bring another layer of precision to what we're talking about. We'd like for each of these two things to be a complete sentence. And right now, they have objects, but they don't have subjects in those sentences. And so we'll make the subject a variable. Let's call it x. Okay. So on the left side of the separator here, x is an NFL team. So that's kind of the, that tells us what kinds of objects are going to live in our set. And then on the right side of the bar, we'll repeat that same x. Right? x belongs to the AFC East division. And now this looks like a more complete set builder notation for the set that I'm talking about. Um, so one of the challenges as you're getting used to using notation uh, and using these three different methods, so the verbal method, the roster method, and a set builder notation method to express an idea about sets and elements, um, really the most interesting part is how do you translate back and forth between those different kinds of expressions. If you give me a roster for a set, how do I maybe come up with a way to describe it verbally? If you give me a verbal description, can I write set builder notation? Or probably the most challenging one is going from set builder notation to either of these other two. So how do I, un how do I decode set builder notation that's given to me to understand better, more explicitly, what is this set actually? Um, so let me pause here, and if you're, if you're watching us on the stream or if you're following along and, and you're in the Slack channel today, um, questions so far about how these different notations are set up, and then I'd like to do a couple more examples uh, of how to go back and forth between these modes of expression. So uh, questions, throw them up there, hit the, hit the stream chat, um, hit up the, the chat within Slack, uh, and let us know uh, if I can clarify something before we go on and do a couple more examples of this. Make sure that I'm in the right place here in my Twitch. So here we are inside Twitch. Uh, whoops. My browser window is not big enough here. If I click watch now. Aha, all right, so we have a question. Oh, and I have a advertisement for Spider-Man. Yeah, that's one of the things I don't like about using Twitch, to be honest, is that occasionally there is an ad that pops up. Twitch is a free, free to use service, um, but this is one of the trade-offs <laughs> that comes along with that. Um, so how did I get that? And I just lost it. Where did my stream chat go? Here we go. All right, so first question coming up in the stream is, what is a power set? That's a great question. Um, and it's especially a great question because that's one of, the, one of the things that can actually help you to think about this week's quiz uh, that you have uh, for our course is, is, what is a power set? So let's talk about it first in the context of this problem, this example uh, that I just presented. So let's go to, let's go to the roster method and then just clear out all the other methods of expressing this set on the screen just so I can make some space. So Patriots, Jets, Bills, Dolphins. Let's make that our set for the moment. Patriots, 
Patriots, Jets, Bills, Dolphins. And the question is, what is a power set? All right, so we can't understand what a power set is uh, until we first talk a little bit about the idea of a subset. So let's start with that. So a subset is a set that we can obtain from a larger set by selecting possibly some, but not necessarily all, of its elements. So if this T up here is a set, then an example of a subset might be, let's, let's write it in a verbal description first, and I'm going to call it U. This would be uh, the set of all AFC East teams um, named after uh, animals. So here is a verbal description of, uh, of a set. And we'll notice that every element that belongs to the set U also has to belong to the set T. So that's the first observation. right? Every element of U is an element of T. Why? Because the set T here has all of the AFC East football teams. And the set U has, well, everything in the set U is also an AFC East football team. Um, but it's not necessarily true that every one of the elements here is also an element there. Right? But if every element of U is also an element of T, then we say U is a subset of T. I was actually just having this conversation with my math majors uh, in our class yesterday, um, because a lot of what math majors have to do at this level uh, is to think about think about sets and how do we make arguments about sets and how do we get information into and out of sets. Um, and so one of the most fundamental things we can look at is how do we locate and describe subsets of larger sets. So here U is a subset of T. Um, and just rhetorically, if I wanted to list a roster for T, or sorry, for U, what is the set of all AFC East teams that are named after animals? Just looking from this roster. Well, again, depending on what your views of the New England Patriots are, um, I think we can agree that Patriots are not animals. Most of them are not, anyway. I think we can make an argument about Belichick. Um, maybe Brady, because Brady's a goat. Um, but the Patriots, we can say, are not named after animals. Um, jets, likewise. Jets are airplanes, they're machines, they're not animals. But Bills and Dolphins, those are both... Well, Bills? I think the Bill... I mean, at least their mascot is a buffalo, so we're going to call them... We're going to call them an animal team. Dolphins, I think there's no argument that they're not actually named after animals. So here, Bills, comma, Dolphins, that's a subset of T. Right? And it's a subset, again, because every one of the elements of U is also one of the elements of T. Now, there happen to be some elements of T that are not represented here in U, right? the Patriots and the Jets. But that's OK. right? Um, all we are claiming here is that this U is a subset of this T doesn't have to go both ways. In fact, the only way for it to go both ways is if the two sets are actually equal. And that's what we mean by sets being equal, is that every element of one of them is also an element of the other. Um, but in this example, u is a mere subset of t, because every element of u is also an element of t, even though it doesn't go the other way. OK, so if that's what subsets mean, and by the way, um, subsets also can be made up of no elements whatsoever. Uh, so I'm going to add that in here as something separate to think about, just a separate note here. The empty set. And the empty set has several different kinds of notation we can use for it. Sometimes it's written just as an empty set of curly braces. Um, it can also be written as an O with a slash through it. 
So don't confuse this with the number zero. Uh, I'll usually put in a big slash just so that it doesn't get confusing. Um, the empty set is the set that has no elements in it whatsoever. Uh, it would be like saying, what's the set of all, uh, all, pre uh, all presidents of the United States who are female, right? So that's a verbal description of a set, but it turns out that that set has no elements in it because we've had no female president of the United States. Um, and the empty set by agreement is always a subset of everything. Uh, and so it counts. Um, also, the entire set T, we could say, is a subset of itself um, because it satisfies this criterion here, that every element of T is also an element of T. Therefore, T is a subset of T. So now that I've beaten subsets pretty well to death, um, let's get to Carrie's question. Carrie's question is, what is a power set? What does power set mean? And this takes a little bit of mathematical thought to really wrap your head around. The power set is a set, first of all. But it's the set whose elements are all of the subsets of T. So mathematicians will often just use the shorthand. It's the set of all subsets uh, of T. So let's look at what that is in this example. So we know what a subset is. The question of power set is, what are all of the subsets that can exist for our given set? So let me clear out some more space here. So if you're asked to find the power set of t, this is asking you exactly the same question as to list all possible subsets of t. And then all will do because that list is not going to be a set. At the end of the day, we're also going to have to put curly braces around that list right? so that it becomes a set in its own right. So I've got these four teams in my set T, four elements. And if I want to list all of the elements, uh, sorry, if I want to list all of the subsets of T that exist, we don't have to do it in any sort of systematic way, but um, Let's suppose that maybe I can start with the empty set. Right. That's always a subset of any set that we start with. So that should always be the first set in our list if we're going to list the elements of the power set. Likewise, the whole set, uh, I'm just going to abbreviate the teams now because I'm not going to want to have to write these over and over again. Let me abbreviate the Patriots by P, the Jets by J, the Bills by B, and the dolphins by D. So the whole set with all four elements, P, J, B, and D, that whole set is another of the elements in this power set, right? Because that's one of the subsets. One of the subsets of T is the subset consisting of all the elements of T. Another subset of T is the subset consisting of no elements of T. All right, so maybe. Let me be a little more systematic here, just to save us some writing time. So we've listed both extremes. We've listed the subset that has no elements. We've listed the subset that has four elements in it. Keep track of those on the side. So no elements, four elements. Now let's think about what are the subsets of T that consist of one element? So what does a subset of T that has only one element in it look like? Well, it's going to be a set of NFL teams from the NFC East, sorry, AFC East, that that set only has one element in it. So the Patriots by themselves in a set. That would be a subset of T that has only one element in it. Likewise, the Jets by themselves in a set. The Bills by themselves in a set. The Dolphins by themselves in a set. Those are all what we might say one element subsets of T. And so each of them is one of the elements in the power set, the power set being the set of all subsets 
the set of all possibilities. And we can continue this game. What about all of these subsets of T that have two elements in them? This, by the way, we can think of as the set of all possible matchups right, that we can make of NFC, AFC East teams with one another. Right? So when the Patriots play the Jets, right, um, that would be, we can think of that as a, as a two element subset of the set of AFC East teams. Um, and there's a bunch of others. Right? The Patriots could play the Bills. The Patriots could play the Dolphins. The Jets could play the Bills. The Jets could play the Dolphins. And the Bills could play the Dolphins. So we have a bunch of two element subsets that we could list. And in each of those, one, two, three, four, five, six, two element subsets is one of the elements in the power set. Sorry about that. So the two element subsets uh, consist of these six. And finally, the three element subsets. So here, we have subsets consisting of three elements chosen from my set. So maybe Patriots, Jets, Bills, Patriots, Jets, Dolphins, Patriots, Bills, Dolphins, and then Jets, Bills, Dolphins. And there's a list of all the subsets that have three elements in them. So at this point, I think we can convince ourselves that we have everything, that we've accounted for every possible subset of the set T. Right? Because my set T begins with four elements in it, I can't have a subset which is bigger than the original set, because everything in the subset has to be something from the big set. Right? And so I can't have more than four elements in any subset. And I can't certainly have any fewer than zero elements uh, in any of our subsets either. So at the end of the day, this now is a list of all of the elements of the power set of T. Um, the only thing we still have to do is to make this answer into a set in its own right. Because if the question is, what's the power set? So far, we've only listed the elements of the power set. In order to make it into a set, we also need to put curly braces around the whole thing. And this is where your head starts to swim a little bit. But that is what it is. So a visualization of the power set is it's the set whose elements are the empty set, the set consisting of the Patriots, the set consisting of the Jets, and so on and so on and so on and so on, all the way up to the entire set itself. So that is the power set of our T. So, let me follow up this question with, uh, with another one. And this gets to something else uh, that we haven't yet had the opportunity to talk about in today's stream. I've alluded to it a little bit. But we can ask the question, how many elements belong to a given set? And the technical term that we give to that answer to that question is called a cardinal number. So if we ask what's the cardinal number of a set, what we're asking is how many elements belong to that set? Yeah, that's all. We're just using a fancy, a fancy mathematical, logical term for that. Right? Cardinal number just says how many elements are in that set. So if I start with T itself, the set here at the top of the screen, I can ask, what's the cardinal number of t? Sometimes we'll write that as card parentheses t, or sometimes we'll use a, a number sign, number sign t, or sometimes vertical bars around a t. I don't know why, but mathematicians never decided on a single notation for cardinal number. Um, so depending on which 
textbook, which author you're reading, you might see any one of these three, uh, or you might just see it written out uh, in an English sentence. I think that's the way we'll often see it in our online homework system. Um, so let's just pick one of these for now. My favorite, I think, is the number sign, because it's really, it's, it's very evocative notation, right? The number of elements in the set T. This is my original set T, and so because we have a roster written down, we can explicitly see that this cardinal number is 4. This set has four elements in it, and so the cardinal number of t is equal to 4. So then the interesting question is, what's the relationship between the cardinal number of t and the cardinal number of the power set of t? In this example, we happen to have listed explicitly all of the elements that belong to the power set. In other words, all of the subsets of my original set. So since we have the roster, we might as well just count and figure out how many we come up with. So there's one here, two, three, four, five there, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, sixteen. So there's 16 subsets for my set T. Um, and I wanted to, to write those numbers out here explicitly because one, one of the mistakes that people make when they start trying to count the power set is sometimes they'll go in and they'll try to start counting the elements within the subsets that make up the elements of the power set. So they'll count this P and this J as two separate things. No, when we're counting the cardinality of a power set, cardinal number of a power set, every element of the power set is a subset of the original set. And so this thing, Patriots and Jets together inside of, uh, of curly braces, that thing is one element in the power set. That element happens to be a set that has two of its own elements, but counted as an element of the power set, it only counts once. It only counts for one thing. So there's 16 elements of the power set because there's 16 subsets of T. So the question that we would ask mathematically is what's the relationship? Would there have been a way for us to know based on the cardinality of the set what's the cardinal number of the power set? If I know how many elements are in T is there a shortcut to figuring out how many elements are in the power set of T? Unfortunately the answer to that is yes there definitely is and to figure that out I think the the easiest way is to just take another tour through all of the, the, the elements that we've listed here, all of the subsets uh, that are elements of the power set. And the first question I'm going to ask is, how many of those elements have the Patriots in them? Right? How many of these subsets include the Patriots? Uh, so if I do that count, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there's 8 subsets that have the Patriots in them. That means there's also eight subsets that don't have the Patriots in them. Okay. So if I divide up all my subsets into those that have the Patriots in them and those that don't, that's going to be a half and half division. And the same thing is true for any of the other uh, teams in my original set. If I look at the Jets, the Jets exist in exactly half of these subsets also. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Right. Same thing with the Bills, same thing with the Dolphins. So to make a subset out of T, all I really need to do is specify for each one of my teams, are you in or are you out? Okay. So I have a choice. Do I want the Patriots or do I not? Two choices. Two choices for whether I want the Jets or not. Two choices for whether I want the Bills or not. Two choices for whether I want the Dolphins or not. And so the number of subsets is really the number of different ways to choose yes or no to flip a light switch on or off for each one of these different teams. And that's where my 16 comes from. Two choices about the Patriots, are they in or out? Two choices about the Jets, are they in or out? Two choices about the Bills, are they in or out? Two choices about the Dolphins, are they in or are they out? And every one of those two choices multiplies together using a principle of probability that we're going to learn in about five weeks from now called the multiplication principle um, because these choices are independent of one another. Multiply them all together, 
we get 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 16. That's how many subsets there are. That's the cardinal number of the power set. So this works for any set that I could have possibly written down. If instead of the AFC East, let's say I chose a different division. Um, not every division in the NFL has four teams in it. Um, I'm going to have to head back to the, the NFL website real quickly here. Just because, again, I don't want to screw this up uh, on a live stream and have everybody at me on Twitter saying, you screwed this up. I thought you were a football fan. Um, so here are the conferences and the divisions as soon as this thing finishes loading up. So there's the AFC East. Maybe because I'm streaming, but the internet connection here is, uh, is being sluggish today. Oh, you know, there used to be teams with, there used to be divisions with more than four teams, but I don't think there are anymore. That shows how much attention I've been paying to the NFL lately. Okay. Um, all right, so supposing that we change the context, um, change it away from football for a moment, uh, and let's say that maybe we made a set of different kinds of fruit. So apple, orange, pear, uh, lemon, and lime. Okay. So now I have a set with a cardinal number of five instead of four. Right? So there's five elements in my set. So how am I going to figure out the cardinal number of this power set? Well, it's the same procedure. We're asking the same questions. That's the beauty of, of mathematics, is that we observe a structure that helps us to solve one problem, but that same structure can be extended to solve more interesting, more complicated, um, and related problems to it. So now that I have five elements instead of four uh, in my original set, I have to make five choices for each fruit now. Are you in or are you out? Two choices for apple, two choices for orange, two for pear, two lemon, two lime. And when I multiply those all together, two times two times two times two times two, two, four, eight, 16, 32. And I'm not going to list out all those elements in the power set because um, I don't feel like writing that much. Um, and plus, I want to conclude here by making the, the point that the quicker way to write this, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, is to use an exponent, 32. And it's 32 because it's 2 to the power of 5. 2 multiplied by itself 5 times in a row. Okay. And that, I hope, gives a, a rationale for the general principle okay, that the cardinal number of a power set cardinal number for the power set of t is related to the cardinal number of t itself and that the cardinal number of t itself is the exponent that we put on the 2 here in this expression. So the cardinal number of a power set of t is 2 raised to the power of the cardinal number of t. I'm going to pause right here for uh, uh, another minute or so, ask if there's more questions about this before we charge forward into our, our last topic for uh, today's virtual meeting, uh, which is going to be about Venn diagrams uh, and the beginnings of set operations. Uh, but let me pause and see if there are, are questions that the stream wants to bring up um, before we go forward. Where did my stream go? There we go. I, think I just have to cheat it out a little bit. All right, so we have about 15 more minutes in today's stream. Um, and I want to use that 15 minutes to get us started with Venn diagrams. Um, Venn diagrams are one of the most useful ways to depict uh, sets. And in particular, um, they can help us to depict how sets relate one to another. It's a way of especially um, thinking about how to take the rosters of various sets uh, and draw a visual diagram that shows how those rosters are related one to another. 
So we're going to be sitting with Venn diagrams for a couple of weeks uh, in our semester um, because we're going to end up getting a lot of mileage out of them, frankly. Uh, so for now, we'll just do a little bit of an intro. So I want to start um, by getting us some more practice with that skill I referred to at the beginning of our meeting, which is taking sets and um, unpacking their set builder notation. So let me give you two sets. I'm going to express both of these sets uh, using set builder notation to start uh, so that we can sort of understand better what's going on here. Um, so let's let my set, uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, let me do three sets. And the first set I'm going to write down is the set I'm calling U. Um, and both the author uh, of our book, as well as the author of many books uh, on, on this subject, will often use U as a, as a shorthand for what's called the universal set. That's kind of the set that, that sets the stage. Uh, of what are all what what's, what are everything in the universe that we're allowed to kind of consider? Um, so in this example, I'm going to take as the universe the set of all x such that x. And I'm going to write this first, and then we'll talk through how to decode this notation. Okay, so there's a set builder notation for a set that I'm going to call u, and if I unpack this into words, it's the set of all x such that, so this vertical bar, this colon, the separator, often we'll read it as the words such that. The set of all x such that x belongs to, so there's another piece of notation that uh, I want to draw attention to today. This little e symbol is short for element of. And so if we make this grammatically correct, it stands for is an element of. Or the shorthand for that, that I'll often use, is belongs to. It's an expression of set membership. It's an expression of a membership of an element within the set that it belongs to. And this n over here, this blackboard bolded n, so it's a capital N that's kind of been doubled up here in the middle, um, this is a set. It's a specific set in mathematics. It's called the set of natural numbers. And the set of all natural numbers is the set of all numbers that we could use to count the cardinal number of a non-empty set. And that's just a really fancy way to say that these are the counting numbers. These are the first numbers that you learn when you're first learning numbers in preschool. One, two, three, four. So here's a roster depiction of the set of natural numbers. So I'll write n over here equals. So it's a set of all numbers we can use for counting, okay, starting from 1 and continuing up by 1s. Um, we can't possibly write every element of this set because there are infinitely many natural numbers. Um, so we'll use this little ellipsis, this three dots here, uh, as a way of saying, well, we're going to stop here, but it keeps going with the pattern that you see here. All right. So this universal set is the set of all x such that x is a natural number and x is less than 9. So in other words, not all of our natural numbers are part of my universe, but just the natural numbers that are less than 9. And so in Venn diagrams, often the universe, and it's good to be explicit about this if we can, uh, the universe is drawn as kind of a big rectangle around the whole thing. right? It kind of draws a fence, and all of the animals that we're about to play with have to, to live within that fence. And so in our example, u is the set of all natural numbers that are less than 9. And we could actually write that down using a roster if we want to. So what are all the natural numbers, the numbers in this set, which are less than 9? Well, 1 is less than 9. 2 is less than 9. So is 3. So is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, but as soon as I get to 9 and anything bigger, now, these elements satisfy x is an element of the natural numbers, but they don't satisfy x is less than 9. 9 is not less than 9. 10 is not less than 9. 11 is not less than 9. So those, and anything which is larger than them, are not a part of my set u. So my roster is going to end right there. So in my Venn diagram, the only elements that I'm going to have inside my universe are the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. 
So there's my universe in this example. All right, now let's set down two more sets, the set X and the set Y. So I'm just going to come along and define uh, a couple more sets, again, using set builder notation. So let's let X be um, the set of all X such that X is an even number and X is less than um, 6. So if we were to express this set verbally, this would be the set of all even numbers that are less than 6. And I should be real careful here. Let me say that x is an even natural number. So mathematically, negative numbers can be even too. Actually, 0 is an even number mathematically. I'm not going to consider those. Um, I, want my, I, want my uh, I want my even numbers here to be even natural numbers. So x is an even natural number, and x is less than 6. So I could write down a roster for x. What are all of the even natural numbers that are less than 6? Uh, well, 1's not even. 2 is, and it's less than 6, so 2 belongs. 3 is less than 6, but it's not even, so it doesn't belong. 4 is a natural number that's even, and it's less than 6. 5 is a natural number. It's less than 6, but it's not even, so it doesn't belong. 6 is an even natural number, but it's not less than 6. And anything bigger than 6 is also not going to belong. Um, and so my set x consists of just 2 and 4. So if we're easing our way towards Venn diagrams, what we might do is we might just go into this universe here and just draw a circle around the elements of x. So now we have a visual depiction of that I have this universe, this universal set in my big rectangle, and some of the elements in that universe belong to the set x, and some of them do not. So what's great about Venn diagrams is that they not only show you in a picture what belongs to a given set, they also will show you at a glance what doesn't belong to that given set. So 2 and 4 in this universe belong to the set x, but 1, 3, 5, 7, 6, and 9, and 8, all of them do not belong to x. So just to get some more terminology into, into your grill today, once we have a universal set to work with, we can also clearly define what it means to think about everything that does not belong to a given set. So if x is everything inside of the red circle, then we can also speak about everything outside of the red circle. Everything outside of the red circle belongs to the universe, but it doesn't belong to x. And so it's called, the set outside the red circle is called x prime, it's written as x prime, and it's called the complement. Complement with an e. It doesn't mean saying nice things. It means sort of accompanying or standing aside of. This is the complement of x. So the complement of x is all the elements that are in the universe, but which are not in the set x. So if I were to write down a roster for that, x prime. 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Oh, and 9. Uh, wait a minute. Why do I have 9 in my universe? You all got to catch me on that stuff. There. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so x complement is 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And remembering from the very beginning of our meeting today, um, the requirement that we always be able to say for sure whether an element is in a set or out of the set means that every element in the universe has to either be an x or not be an x, which means if I look at x and the complement of x, I should find every element in the universe in one of those, exactly one of those two sets, right? And so one way to make sure that we've got the complement right is just by reading through the universe and figuring out where each of these elements live. One belongs to the complement, two belongs to x. 3 belongs to the complement, 4 belongs to x, 5 belongs to the complement, 6, 7, and 8 belong to the complement. So we've accounted for every element of the universe in either x or the complement of x. And therefore, we have the complement of x right. Cool. Um, let me take that complement stuff away for the moment. It's one of the beauties of working with a digital whiteboard, as we can just rewind. And now let's talk about the set. Let's define one more set y so that we can get to our Venn diagram for the day. We're going to let y 
be the set of x's um, such that x is a perfect uh, x is a perfect square. And what I mean by a perfect square is it's the result of multiplying an integer by itself. So, for example, 25 is a perfect square because it's equal to 5 times itself, 5 times 5. So if I look in my universe and I find where my perfect squares are, um, 1 is a perfect square because it's 1 times itself, 2 is not, 3 is not, 4 is because it's 2 times 2, 2 times itself, right? Um, but 5, 6, 7, and 8, those are not perfect squares. And so a roster for the set y is 1 and 4. And so what I might do up here in my Venn diagram is I might just draw a, sort of a weird kidney-shaped loop around 1 and 4 to denote that that's my set y. Okay. Um, and so this is sort of a prototypical Venn diagram. Um, it doesn't look very pretty right now, and we're going to prettify it in a second. But the key features are that it shows us what's in each set and what's not in each set. And in order to do that, it has to show what's in all the universe as well. Right? So the key elements of a Venn diagram are set out your universe that gives us all of the players on our stage, uh, that is this, this set argument. Uh, and then within that rectangle, um, sketch out overlapping uh, circles or ellipses or overlapping sort of loops uh, that show us what belongs to each of the sets uh, that we're trying to depict. So I'm going to try and clean up this Venn diagram, make it look a little bit more conventional, uh, and then we'll wrap up by also talking about our first set operation, which is called the union. So what I want to do to clean this up is I want to just put in my two, I could use circles, I could use ellipses, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're going to give them the ability to overlap, and then we're going to label each one of them. So I'll label the one on the left here with x, because this is going to contain the elements of my set x. The one on the right, we'll label it with a y. And by the way, it is best practice to label the sets in your Venn diagrams with the label on the outside of them, so that we don't accidentally confuse this x as being one of the elements of this set. x is the name of this set. It's not one of the elements of this set. And then I just have to go back through and put the elements here where they belonged. So remember, x had 2 and 4 in it, so 2 and 4. y had 1 and 4 in it, so I'm going to kind of do it this way. And then all of the other numbers, so 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8, all of those didn't belong to x. They didn't belong to y, but they're still in the universe. So I'm going to put them on the outside of those uh, overlapping ellipses. Um, OK. So that's nice, except there's one problem with this Venn diagram as it's written right now. And the problem is that we have the same element, 4, written in two different spots. And remember, if the order in which we write the elements of a set doesn't matter, then neither does how many times we write a given element. Because all that matters is, is that element in or is it out? If I write it five times inside of a set, it's the same thing as if I only wrote it once. It's in, right? So I really need to only write this 4 once. So the question is, how do I put it? Where, where should I put it? And this is the other beauty of a Venn diagram. is Because 4 belongs both to the set x and to the set y, then it should belong, it should be inside both the circle for x and the circle for y. And we can do that by putting it here, where the circles for x and y overlap one another. So now here is a Venn diagram that's cleaned up, and it very clearly shows what belongs to what. So just to, to wrap things up. I want to introduce, we already got an introduction to the, uh, the set complement operation. Let's get an introduction also uh, to two more set operations. Uh, and this will help out as we start out the week next week. We're going to think more about how these operations on sets work. The first operation is called intersection. And as the name suggests, the intersection of two sets, which will depict using this weird upside down u. It's a little it's called a cap, mathematical cap. Um, and that's the notation we'll use for the intersection of x with y. The intersection of x with y consists of all the elements that belong to both the set x and the set y. So it's the overlap. In our Venn diagram, that's this region right here. So the intersection of x with y in this example if we were to write out a roster for it, 
is the set consisting of the number four. That's the only element which is both an even natural number less than six and is also a perfect square. Right? So we call that the intersection. It's everything that belongs to x and also belongs to y at the same time, simultaneously. And the second of our set operations is called the union. And for the union, we'll take that, that symbol in between and flip it upside down so that it looks like a u. That's kind of the easy way to remember which one of these is which. The, the u looks like the union. And to get the union, what we'll do is instead of looking at where these two sets overlap, we're going to take all the elements in both of these sets and just throw them all into one big pot. Right. So instead of insisting that the elements of the union belong to both sets, for the union, they just need to belong to either or. Right. So another way of thinking about what the union is, is it's all the elements that belong to x or y or possibly both. And so it's comprised of all the elements in the region that I've shaded here. If we were to write out a roster for it, that roster would have the elements 1, 2, and 4 all in it. So thinking logically, uh, an intersection is really asking an and question, sometimes called a conjunction. If you've taken philosophy 111, you know what a conjunction is, right? conjunctive reasoning. It means that both conditions have to be true in order to belong. So the intersection is those elements which simultaneously belong to both the set x and the set y. In this example, that's just four. It's where my Venn diagram circles overlap. The union is the logical disjunction, the or question. What are all the elements that belong to one or the other of these sets? And in this example, that's one, two, and four. So we're going to leave that there for today. Um, we got today an introduction to a couple of things. Um, first of all, to a variety of different notations that we can use to express sets verbally, using a roster, using set builder notation. Um, we also gained some practice thinking about cardinal numbers, subsets, and power sets. Right? So a power set being the set of all subsets of a given set. So that's what we did back here. We had a set of four elements, and then we found out that its power set has 16 elements. Uh, and from there, we arrived at this uh, supposition, this general hypothesis, that the, the cardinal number of a power set is nothing more than the um, than 2 raised to the cardinal number of the original set. So that was a super helpful little formula. It's really the only formula that we encountered today. And then we had an introduction to Venn diagrams, uh, in which we figured out how to use a Venn diagram to express some ideas about sets uh, and then also how to begin to use Venn diagrams to think about the set operations of intersection and also of union. So keep up the good work. Um, if you've just watched this after the fact, um, please jump into our Slack channel or uh, I'll put this up on YouTube. You can also uh, contribute questions and comments there uh, to engage if there's something you want to clarify. Um, but keep up the good work. Uh, we'll schedule another session like this for next week. It may be at the same time. It may be at a different time. Um, I'm going to try and switch them up a little bit so that everybody has maximal opportunity to participate live. Um, thanks for watching, uh, and we'll see you in and around the virtual web for our next class meeting.